Good morning, Woodlands Church. We are so glad to have you here with us this morning. I'm Pastor Doug. It's my privilege to serve in the area of outreach and connections. We're so glad that each of you are here in person. Those of you watching online, thanks for tuning in with us. If you're here with us for the very first time, we'd love to invite you to stop by our information center so that we can get to know you and help you connect to that next step that you want to get involved in Woodlands Church. If you do, we have a little gift for you, so we encourage you to stop by that, that information center. We have an exciting service this morning. We have, we had seven all together. We had three people baptized in the last service. We have four people being baptized in this service, a chance to celebrate with them what God is doing in their life. After witnessing this baptism, that'll be a little later in the service, if you are prompted to consider baptism yourself, uh, you can go online at woodlandschurch.org slash baptism and find out a little bit more about it. We'll contact you then if you're interested in being a part of our next baptismal service in February. We got a couple of things coming up in the next two weeks that we want you to be aware of. First of all is the Senior Fellowship Luncheon, which is this Tuesday at 1130. It's a potluck, bring a dish to pass. It's anybody 55 and older can participate in that. After enjoying a nice lunch together, you'll hear from Pastor John and his heart for Thanksgiving. And in Thanksgiving service, we have our special annual Thanksgiving service that we look forward to every year on Tuesday. November 26th, that's going to be a service followed by a pie social for fellowship. So if you like to do that and you can bring a pie, please bring a nut-free pie out of sensitivity. We have some folks in the congregation that have a deathly allergy to peanuts and other nuts, so we ask you to avoid that. But bring a pie, pre-slice it, bring it in a dish that you can leave behind or at least put your name on it so we know who you are. They'll be collecting those Sunday, the 24th of November, all the way through Tuesday evening. So prepare for that. Would you give your attention to the screen? Uh, to get a little recap of uh, what God did at Trunk or Treat this year. Thank you. Hey, Woodlands family. I can tell you that after tonight of Trunk or Treat, there aren't even words. Our God is so good. This rain that we were a little bit worried about turned out to be a tremendous blessing from our God who knows what we need. There were over 2,000 people who came into our building, who stepped into our doors, some of them for the very first time. It took over 350 of you giving of your time the night of Trunk or Treat, and many more of you gave you your candy or your tithe money to help us get candy uh, to pull off this incredible, event. Well, Blins, I can tell you that there aren't even words to describe uh, what Chunk or Treat truly felt like. Um, and if you are here for the first time because you came to Chunk or Treat, we are really glad you're with us. Uh, we are so glad that you have chosen to come back after Chunk or Treat. We just want to say a big welcome to you. Well, Blins family, thank you for helping us pull off this incredible event. Nailed it.
friends. I'm Tim. You know, a after planting and caring for your garden, it's good to stand back and see how far it's come. It's not always easy, but the growth makes it worth it. In Acts 14, verses 24 through 28, Paul and Barnabas returned to the churches they helped plant, encouraging the believers and celebrating the growth God brought. They didn't just move on, they came back to see how those seeds of faith were flourishing. It's important to take a moment and appreciate the growth, to encourage others and keep working together. That's when we see the real fruit of our labor. So take a look at what you've planted and celebrate. Happy planting, friends. Good morning, friends. Welcome to this church. We're glad you're here to worship with us. Um, we are in the middle of a series in the book of Acts, going through Paul's first missionary journey. We're actually going to... Uh, end his missionary journey today. He's going to land back in the church of Antioch. Uh, but before we jump into that passage and that sermon, uh, I've got um, a couple sermons before the sermon. Is that okay? They're, we'll get out on time. Don't worry. It'll be fine. Uh, but just kind of some things kind of just sparked that I wanted to share and talk through. Um, we had this uh, recap just now for Trunk or Treat. And uh, it was really one of these events that... I, exceeded what we thought we could, was going to happen. And I don't know if you, it wasn't really about numbers, honestly. It had nothing to do with 2,000 plus people or, or whatever. It had something to do with the stories that we heard after this event. And they were not what you would expect, you would, the kind of stories you would get from like just handing out candy, right? Because no one said, hey, thank you so much. You gave my children more sugar on Halloween or or whatever, or I was so glad to see adults dressed up in costumes. It was nothing like that. There were stories of people who felt welcomed and loved and people that were part of our church and people that weren't part of our church. Uh, talking about not the experience, but the people. Uh, the, not, the, um, not that it was well run, but the love that they experienced when they were here. Um, in stories that really, honestly, frankly, couldn't make sense other than just the Holy Spirit doing something in the lives of people that were here. And I was processing this with Keely this last week, and what was really kind of interesting is she kind of brought it me into clarity for me. She said it was as if the fruit of the Spirit was being displayed for our community. And when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, you can go to Galatians 5.22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Because right in front of this it talks about the fruits of the sinful nature. And so those things have been crucified. Now what's left are the fruits of the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit and let us not become conceited, provoking envy from each other. You see, there's this beautiful thing that happens when the body of Christ allows the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in their lives and the world can see it. And what's interesting about these things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness, all of these things, we see when we're in community with one another. For example, love. It, that's displayed when we love one another, right? It's, it's something that happens inside of this thing called the church or community. You need other people to show love, right? Or gentleness. I don't get to practice, or I don't get to practice that fruit of the spirit unless I have something to, someone to be gentle with. Goodness. Faithfulness. Being faithful to one another. Patience. Being patient with one another. Sometimes we have to be patient with one another, right? All of these fruits of the Spirit, they're, they're displayed inside the context of community with one another. And what I think, what I think happened was that we got to display the fruit of the Spirit to our world. And that's a beautiful thing because it's not us but Christ in us that we want the world to see, Right? 
And so when we, when we live out these fruits of the Spirit and we practice them in this area, we get a chance to practice them in all of the areas that God has called us to be. So I'm going to pivot just a little bit away from trunk or treat to the world that we live in today. Regardless of how you feel about the election results, you and I get an opportunity to practice the fruits of the Spirit in our world today. We get to practice love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we all in this room, we have people that are probably from different ends of the political spectrum, but we get to practice this in community together. And practicing it around candy and costumes is one thing, but that's important, isn't it? Because if you can practice it there, then as we take into the other areas, we can practice this same heart and fruit of the Spirit towards each other and to the community around us. And I, I continue to believe that the church is to be the bright spot in a world that is dark. And the way that we are the bright spot is when we exhibit these things. If you get some time, go back and look at the Galatians passage where it says, put to death these sinful things. By the way, one of them is disunity. It's, it's dissension. We put to death these things, but we exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Isn't that a cool opportunity we get that you and I have now, regardless of where you land politically? I get excited about the opportunity for the church. And it's us going out and just letting the Holy Spirit be evident in our lives. I want to give a couple suggestions real quick. This is kind of more like a pastoral moment where I want to just give up where I've seen this go wrong. Just want to caution us about our speech. To have grace-filled words. Uh, Psalms 141 puts it this way. It says, set a guard over your mouth. Or it's David saying, he says, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the doors of my lips. Has anybody said something stupid ever? Anybody? Maybe someone's like, yeah, this morning or whatever. (laughs) You know, I I just want us to guard our words because the way that we speak can tear someone down on accident or lift somebody up on purpose. And, And when we guard our words, we can be careful. Guard your words in the times when your guard is down. That's why it says guard your words. Think about the lobby. I'm not picking anybody or pointing anything out. Just think about the times in the lobby. We can just flippantly say a foolish word that isn't guarded or in a coffee shop or just be careful. Guard our words so that we can um, bring words of healing as opposed to words of hurt. Uh, Keep our trust in Jesus. Our trust is not in any sort of government or person in government. Our trust is not in any party. Our trust is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And we can never lose sight of that. And so sometimes we can, we can become overjoyed or overfearful because our trust has maybe been misplaced a little bit. Let's make sure that we know that our trust is in Jesus alone. And then my last kind of encouragement for us is let's be people of prayer. Let's be people that take our time and pray for those around us and for our nation and for the unity of the body of this church. I said it in several, several weeks past, and I'll say it again. The enemy would love nothing more than to create disunity or division inside the body of Christ making it un- in- ineffective in its mission. So would you mind joining me in praying right now? Father, we love you. We do thank you that we live in a, a remarkable place in which we can vote and we can choose leaders. Lord, sometimes that can put up a, an idea that it's, it's in our hands, but Lord, we know that it is in your hands. And so Lord, I pray that you would remind us that you are still sovereign over all things. Lord, I pray that you would help us to guard our mouths, uh, guard the words that come out of the doors of our mouth, that they would be words of healing, words of honey and sweetness. Lord, I pray that we would put our trust in you alone. And as we live in our community and to our schools and to our neighborhoods and to our workplaces, that we will show the world your spirit that we will show love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, 
faithfulness and self-control, Lord, that you would do, let us be a light into this world as we put on display your, your fruits in our lives. We love you and we praise you. In your matchless name we pray these things. Amen. We are going to jump back into Acts 14. And Dave uh, went all the way to 24 last week, but I'm going to kind of back us up and start in 21 because there's a lot of real, really neat stuff in there that's going to kind of go along with the uh, harvest of the fruits of Paul's ministry. And um, uh, that's what this is about. You're going to see all of these, these neat opportunities where Paul is experiencing the fruit of the work that he did, the, the, the struggles that he went through, the travel he went through, the preaching in the synagogues and with the Gentiles that he had. Uh, all of these things, are gonna, you're going to see some fruit come out of it, and he's going to see how he tends to that fruit. What does the harvest look like? So the, service is, the, the lesson is called the Harvest Festival. Now, I got a chance to do something last week and that I have never done before. And for the first time ever, Samuel and I went deer hunting. Anybody else ever, any deer hunters in the room? I'm in Wisconsin. Every hand should go up, I think. Uh, this is the first time I've never, I'm not, didn't come from a hunting family, but this is the first time Samuel and I went deer hunting. He wanted to go hunting. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. So we found this program that was a learn to hunt program and we got to be a part of it. And on Saturday, we sat in a blind for 12 hours, memorizing all the trees in front of us. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about if you've hunted, right? You're just sitting there, and you're like, okay. And you're like, ooh, what? Oh, the squirrel. Okay. <laughs> you know, and uh, you're up there. You're there early. You go through, and, and uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you're kind of falling asleep. Sometimes you're whatever. But it's, it was this long Saturday, and... Um, all day Saturday, we saw 12 deer, and, but we weren't able to harvest one. And so the day was over. And the next day was Sunday, and it was daylight savings time. And I thought, I'm going to lose. Like, that's the hour that I get back every year, right? It's the best sleep night of the year, and I was going to lose that. And then I looked at the weather, and I'm like, oh, cool. It's going to be raining tomorrow morning. And so we went out, and we ended up uh, getting our first deer, uh, on Sunday morning, and it was a blast, okay? I didn't, no pun intended, right? <laughs> that was for you, Doug. That was for Doug Schneider. Loves his puns. Anyway, so we, we got a chance to do this, and what I, I, it was a lot of work, and we did all the things, and what I didn't realize was after you have done the work, you still have a lot more work to do. Like, someone's got to make sure the meat comes off of this thing, and you have to make it so that you can now eat it. I, had, I knew it was going to be a lot, but I didn't know really exactly how much it was. And if it wasn't for Brad Johnson and Doug Schneider helping us figure it out, I would have been lost. But we spent the next six hours that evening learning how to process the harvest of a deer. And it was a lot of work. Anybody ever processed a deer? Again, everybody. Like, I love Wisconsin. You guys are you love to process Forest creatures. It's amazing. <laughs> but anyway, so we, we learned that the work isn't just in the hunt, but it was also in the harvest of the hunt. Paul's gone through all of this work, all of these travels, all of this heartache, but the work really kind of starts here for him. And in, it flies through these passages, but I don't want us to miss the hard work of the harvest. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 9, 35. He says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he, was, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This morning, I want us to talk about the harvest, but I want you to think of yourself as laborers in the harvest. That we ought to pray that we would go out and be those that are able to harvest. It's not easy work to tend to the fruit of the harvest. Let me pray. God, I pray that you would challenge us where we need to be challenged, convict us where we need conviction. And in all things, you get all the glory. In your precious name, 
Amen. Acts one twenty one. we're going to jump in. When they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples. If you remember, at this point, they're in the city of Derby. And they had started in Antioch, Pisidia. If you want to look at a map, Antioch, Pisidia. Then they went to Iconium, then Lystra. And that's where Paul was um, stoned and left for dead. And the disciples brought him in the city, and then they brought him to the next city called Derby. And now he's in the city of Derby. And in Derby, it seems as though the, the Jews leave him alone. He doesn't get persecuted in Derby. Maybe they thought he was dead. But he's left alone, and he gives this, gives this opportunity to, it says, they made many disciples. What's really interesting there about that word, made many disciples, is it's a different word than some of the other words we might see when it comes to evangelism. So it's not the word for evangelism. So he didn't just go and share the gospel. The another word that might sometimes used is uh, to proclaim or to preach. It's a different Greek word. Here, it's the same word that's used in Matthew 28, 18, where it says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What you get is a sense that in Derby, at the end of this road, he gets a chance to actually sit and train the disciples that come to know Christ in Derby. He takes time and gives them roots, and then he's going to take care of the harvest in the cities that he previously went to. Verse 21 continues. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium, into Antioch. Now, again, if you remembered last week, if you know what happened in Lystra and Iconium. In Iconium, they were run out by the Jews because there was a plot against Paul's life. In Lystra, he was actually stoned to death, well, almost to death, drug out of the city and dropped off for dead. Let me ask you this. If that had ever happened to you in any city, are you going to go back into that town? Paul realizes that it's so important to tend to the harvest of those cities that he goes back into the towns that had previously abused and persecuted him. Not only that, but in Iconium, in in Antioch, those are the Jews that went to Lystra. So he's probably walking the street and seeing the same guys. And those guys are probably saying, I thought we killed that guy. But Paul knows that what he's doing is so important, tending to the harvest is so important to the future of the church. And so he takes care of the harvest. We see it in verse 22. So we turn to Lystra and to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples. The first thing we have to do in the harvest is to take care of it, to strengthen the souls of the disciples, to strengthen each other, to strengthen those who are new in the faith. Paul strengthens the souls of the disciples. I was thinking about our first house in Minnesota. We only had one house in Minnesota, but our house in Minnesota. And we moved in, and they had these really cool flower beds, like probably a lot the size of this this baptism. And they had these beautiful flowers. It was early in the summer, and all the flowers were blooming, and they had these beautiful like green plants that had these white in it. What are the hostas or something other, some plant person out there knows what it is. And we had these beautiful flower beds and we didn't know how to tend to those flower beds. We kind of looked things up and tried to understand, but what we learned is if you didn't tend to the flower beds, guess what happens to all the flowers in the flower beds? They don't stay. They go away. They die. In fact, weeds come in and they overrun. One of our flower beds, the dogs decided to use that as their bathroom. That flower bed didn't make it. But we had to have someone come and share with us, this is what this plant is. This is when it comes into bloom. This is when that, what that plant is. This is how you take care of it. This is how you get it ready for winter so that it comes back in the spring. We had to learn how to harvest and tend to these places in our garden. Paul's doing the same thing. He's coming back and he's training the church. This is how you take care of the fruit that's already been produced in your community. And he does it in interesting ways. Verse 22, in, what does he do? He encourages them, encouraging them to continue in their faith. He encourages them to keep going. Don't stop. Do you have someone in your life that's going to keep you going? 
Someone who's going to tell you when, you, when it gets hard, when you're going through a struggle, when you're struggling with even sin, or if you're going through a hard time in life, do you have someone who's going to help you keep going, even if you're doing good? Paul talks to the Galatians later on, and it's the same group of people in Galatians 6, 9. He says, let us not grow weary doing good, as some are, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those who are part of the household of faith. Do you have somebody who's going to encourage you to keep going? Don't stop. He also uses words to encourage their soul. We need each other to encourage each other's soul, and we often can do that with our words, can't we? There's something about someone coming up and saying, hey, great job. I saw this in the way that you were parenting your kiddos. Congratulations, good job, keep going. Hey, I know you've been working on this. Congratulations, keep going, don't stop. Proverbs 16, 23, it says, a wise man's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. Pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. I imagine Paul, as he's coming through these churches, he's using his words that are sweet to the soul and healing to the bone. We need to encourage one another. And then he talks about trials. Look at what he says. He says um, in that same verse, he says, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He's honest with them. They're going to experience hardship. In fact, in these particular cities, Paul knows what that's like because these are the cities that he was persecuted in. Sometimes we need to encourage one another in the trials that they're going through in the moment. If you've ever gone through something tough, if you've ever experienced sorrow and and heartache, you need other brothers and sisters that are going to walk along with you. This is what Paul's doing. He's encouraging them. He's saying, you're going to go through hard times. Hang in there. He doesn't just tend to their souls, strengthen their souls. He also gives them structure. Look at verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord, in whom they had believed. Not only do they give them, they tend to their souls, but he also gives them structure. He gives them leadership, an elder a group of elders that are there to shepherd and guide and oversee the body of believers that are in those particular cities. At Woodlands Church, we also have a group of elders whose job is to shepherd and watch doctrine and make sure that we are tending and shepherding the body of Christ. I'm going to invite you, just throughout your week, pray for these, this group of people. They, they, They play a pivotal role in the part of Woodlands Church. And Paul, establishing elders in these places, gives them leadership and structure. And I imagine even these elders are able to teach. That's one of the requirements of elders that Paul gives elders. They're able to teach. Now, why do you think that would be really important for a young church? They need to know and understand the word of God. They need to be able to teach. We have an incredible teaching ministry here. We have classes and groups. If you haven't had a chance to go through Bible 101, I would strongly encourage you to go through it. Whether you've been a believer for a little bit of time or, or just you know, a while, be a part of Bible 101. It teaches you how to study your Bible. That's tending the harvest. It's make, taking care of the fruit that is you. And so Paul establishes the elders in a leadership structure at the church. He's taking care of the harvest. The second point I want to share is that he enjoys the harvest. I imagine as he's going from city to city, he's seeing people that he saw come to know the Lord, but he didn't know the rest of their story. Wouldn't that be fun to see? That you get a chance to see someone who trusted in Christ, continues to trust in Christ. He enjoys the harvest. He does with this with the Philippians. We read in Philippians 1.3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all making for you are all making my prayers with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, 
that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. I'm sure he enjoyed the harvest as he went from place to place to place. Verse 24. And they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went to Attilia. Y'all know all these places? This is what it felt like when I moved to Wisconsin and we all started just talking about Waukesha this and uh, Shuba Shuba and all the different places. <laughs> I mean, the names of the cities in Wisconsin are crazy. This is how I felt when I came to Wisconsin. But here's what it is. It's that he's in Derby. He goes to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. He, we already read that. But then he starts coming south through the same dangerous mountains that he went through the first time. And he goes to Perga, Attilia, and then over to Antioch, which is the church that sent him out in the first place. He's back at his home church. He makes it all the way there. And we see in verse 26, and from there he sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. What a homecoming that must have been. I don't know if they sent word ahead of time, whether what it would look like, but when they came in and they saw Paul and Barnabas, they would have been like, tell us what happened. They, they had prayed for them. They had, they had been called out amongst their leadership and sent to go into the mission field. They probably had no idea what had happened. And so Paul comes and he enjoys sharing the harvest. He gets to share it with this church that sent him out in the first place. We see it in verse 27. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done for, with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles and they remained no little time with the disciples. They declared all that God had done with them. Imagine all the things they could have shared. I'm sure they shared what happened in Cyprus with the proconsul that asked to hear the gospel and they went to share it. And then there was this uh, magician that tried to get in the way and God blinded him to take him out of the picture. I'm sure they talked about uh, the travels that they went uh, through sea and how hard those were. They would have shared about the times when they went to the synagogues and, and they, they shared the gospel to the Jews and those that accepted it, accepted it, but many rejected and so they went to the Gentiles. They would have shared about the time in Lystra where they were confused for Zeus and Hermes and how they almost started to riot and then how they were beaten up and stoned and kicked out of the city. They would have shared all of these trials and they would have shared how God had brought them through each and every one of them. They would have mentioned people in the different cities. I imagine they would have even shared by name the elders in those different cities. They would have prayed for them and they would have considered them and they would have, they would have bound their hearts to them. Paul might have even shared disappointments. When John Mark left and... He felt deserted. He would have shared the time when he was sick going over to Antioch of Pisidia and how he was, God gave him the, the strength to preach while he was sick. They would have shared those struggles and those setbacks as well, and they would have said how God had saw them through that. They would have shared all of this. Imagine how... Rewarding it would have been for the church to hear those stories. The beautiful picture of a church that has sent somebody out and is coming back and they're sharing in the harvest with Paul. I think about the times that we get the privilege of hearing from some of the missionaries that we get a chance to send out here at Woodlands Church. We're soon about to send out, um, we, we commissioned a couple weeks ago, Phil and Terry Barker, they're, on their, they're going to be going to Uganda really soon. I'm looking forward to the day when they come back and we get to hear what God did in their ministry. But we have other times where missionaries come and they share what God has done. This is our privilege to share in the harvest. And what happens is it encourages us, encourages us, us encourages us. We get a chance to be inspired and, and challenged to go and be laborers in the field. Remember Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because of they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. 
Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord that the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into the harvest. Who are the laborers to be? That's you and me. We get a chance to be laborers into the field, and we get to share in the stories together, encourage one another with stories as you see. Today, we're going to get the privilege of sharing in baptism, being able to see and be encouraged in the stories of how God has taken somebody from death to life, slavery to freedom, the harvest. We get to share in that together. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. This picture of Paul as he backtracks into dangerous places, known dangerous places, we see how important it is not just to share the gospel, to plant the seed, but also to tend the harvest, to take care of the fruit. But I pray that we would do that well here uh, in this faith community as we teach the word of God and as we teach uh, obedience to the word of God, as we encourage one another to keep going and to uh, persevere through trials, all of these things, Lord, I pray that you would help us to strengthen the souls of the disciples, to tend to the fruit. And Father, I pray that you would, um, today as we celebrate and joyfully get to see lives that have been changed through the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that it would inspire us to be harvesters in the field. The, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Call us out as laborers into the, to the field. Just a moment, we're going to sing a song. and um, talks about the dry, uh, dry bones rattling, and it's, it's, it's kind of an illustration to talk about the... the death into life. And when we celebrate baptism, that's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating a life that used to be dead in sin. Without Christ, each and every one of us are dead in our own transgressions. But Christ, because of his great love for us, and while, us, when, while we were still sinners, he died for us, bringing us from death and life. And so the, the, the chorus in the song talks about dry bones rattling, and it's just re- reflecting back to going from death into life. And let's celebrate and share in the harvest right now. Let's stand and let's sing.
Amen. Praise God for what he is doing. Paul, in the letter to the people of Galatia, in the book of Ephesians, or Galatians chapter 3, says this, So in Christ you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Each one of these folks here today being baptized that are taking the step of obedience are essentially saying, I am putting on the clothes of Christ. I am putting on Christ as my identity. I am no longer going to live as I used to live. I'm taking off the old and putting on the new. I'm putting my trust in Jesus. I may have many allegiances, but first and foremost, the God of all heaven and the God of all creation is going to shape my thinking about what I will be allegiant to, and first and foremost, I will be allegiant to him. I will follow him as Lord and Savior of my life above all else. At Woodlands Church, we practice child dedication for infants and young children committing as parents and as a church to raise them in the love and the care of the Lord and praying for them that they would come to a place where they understand too the incredible love and goodness of God and they would choose to turn away from all of other allegiances and put their trust in Christ alone. That he would shape their minds and their thinking and give them the hope that is eternal. And so we reserve baptism for those who have made a conscious and informed decision to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord of their life. It is only through Christ that we can see a relationship with Christ develop, that we can say no to the old and say yes to the new and have our hearts actually changed by the God of the universe, transformed into his likeness. The Apostle Paul in first chapter of John, verse 10 says that though the world was made through him, the world did not know him. That he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But to those who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children born not of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. And there's something really powerful about those three phrases. At the end, they distinguish us from being mere creatures of God, fearfully and wonderfully made in His image, to being people who are actually His children, adopted because of the work that He's done on the cross. Welcomed into His family because He wants us in His family. And therefore, Paul says in Romans 10, 9, that if we confess, declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of sin that separates us from a good and holy God. Saved from the power of sin right now in our lives. Now we no longer have to be slaves to it. We don't have to obey and run around in foolish darkness. We can learn from God and be about the things that matter most to him. And ultimately in heaven, saved from the presence of sin and all that makes a mess of what God intended to be good. And so Paul says again in Romans 6, we were therefore buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so baptism is this beautiful word picture of being buried with Christ and being raised to newness of life. The Apostle Paul described our relationship before knowing Christ as being dead in our transgressions and sins. And as mentioned last week, that means every one of us who believes in the Lord is a miracle. Do you believe in miracles? Amen? God does powerful work in our life, bringing us from death to life. And if you were to witness somebody raising from the dead into life, how would you respond? That's how we want to respond this morning, exactly, to those who are being raised from death in the waters to baptism to new life in Christ. So when they come up out of the water, let's celebrate with all heaven together. With that in mind, we want to welcome Jeremy, whose testimony we have heard behind the scenes. And we're going to experience his commitment to follow Jesus in all of life for all of life. Jeremy, it's good to see you. Have you put your trust and faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? I have. And is it your purpose, intent, and commitment to follow Jesus in all of life for all of life? Then having heard your profession of faith, it is our joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.
Good morning, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be baptized. I grew up Catholic for most of my life, as young as I can remember. I was baptized as an infant and received communion through the church, and I was an altar boy for most of my middle and high school years. I enjoyed going to church, but when I got to my senior year of high school, I decided to step away from the church for personal reasons. I wasn't a bad kid growing up. I didn't make any bad choices while I was away from the church. I still believe in God. The past seven years, I didn't go to church because of trauma. I had suffered my senior year of high school. People that I talked to and hung out with wanted me to go to church with them. I just never had any interest in going. I hadn't noticed anything God was doing in my life for seven years. I thought I was always getting the short end of the stick, till I met my now wife in September of 2022. That is when God made himself known to me. And that's when I heard him, heard the Holy Spirit saying to me, Lord, send me. Naomi showed me Woodlands in the winter of 2023, and I was a little skeptical of coming. I haven't ever really thought of going to church. I remember being scared out of my mind, but little did I know she helped me find a church that accepted me for me. Naomi also introduced me to John Timmy, who showed me how a true friendship with fundamental value of having Jesus at the center of our life could be. The verse that speaks to me the most is Hosea chapter 6, verses 1-3. through three. Come on, let's go back to God. He has hurt us, but he'll he heal us. He'll hit us hard, but he'll put us right again. In a couple days, we'll feel better. By the third day, he'll have made us brand new, alive and on our feet, fit to face him. We're ready to study God, eager for God knowledge. As sure as dawn breaks, so sure is his daily arrival. He comes as rain comes, as spring rain refreshing the ground. Since giving my life to Jesus, I have become a better husband and dad all thanks to the grace of God. I now serve on the safety team at Woodlands, fulfilling the command to be the hands and feet of the Lord. So today I am going to be baptized to show my love and commitment to him. Amen. Jeremy, have you put your trust and faith in Christ alone for the... Zach, <laughs> have you put your... We know what Jeremy has. How about you, Zach? Have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes, sir. And is it your intent, purpose, and will to follow Jesus in all of life, for all of life? Yes, sir. Then having heard your testimony and your profession of faith, it's with great joy that we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. and I am here to get baptized today. I had a pretty tough start to my life. When I was only 10 months old, my biological dad left my life. Then when I was four, I lost my best friend, my uncle, to suicide. I had become very sad, but I knew I had to keep going. Then in first grade, I started to be bullied. That's when I started self-harm. I made myself bleed and ended up leaving a scar that I have to this day. Then when this was happening, my mom started me in my youth group with my leader to this day, Miss Jeannie. Through Miss Jeannie's guidance and reading of the Bible, I found my path to God, my Savior. Thank you, Miss Jeannie. I love our group. Then in fifth grade, at the end of the school year, almost beginning of summer, I lost my childhood cat, Sylvie, to cancer. I was really mad at myself for no reason, when I couldn't have done anything to prevent it. I still miss Sylvie, as he was a reminder of my uncle, but I know that with God, I would be able to make it through this sadness. There's one story in the Bible I really like called Acts 9. That where the Lord got upset with Saul because he was doing unworthy things to Christians. And so the Lord took away his sight. Then the Lord went to a fellow Christian, Annas, and told him to go to Saul and heal him, then baptize him. Annas asked the Lord, are you sure? But goes anyways out of obedience. This story showed me that you have to look past the person and decision and obey God and do what he wants you to do. So today, I am here to do what God wants me to do, which is give him my heart, my soul, and my body to him, which I am here to do today. Amen. Aubrey, have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And is it your intent, your purpose, and, and commitment to follow Jesus in all of life and for all of life? Yes. Then having heard your profession of faith, it is with great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Woo! 
Hi, I am Naomi Olson, and I am here to get baptized. I grew up in a very strong Christian home where my family regularly attended church, and for most of my younger years, my parents attended a Bible study. When I was in third grade, I knew if I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I would have everlasting life, and so I was baptized. However, when I got to high school, I did not have a steady and strong relationship with Jesus. I became pregnant in 11th grade and a single mom my sophomore year of college. Then my last year of college, I lost my brother to suicide. During this time, I did not turn to God for comfort and healing, but instead tried to handle these traumas on my own. It was not until I came to Woodlands and joined a small group led by Michelle Bruzewich that I was reminded of the forgiveness and steadfast love of Jesus. Within that group, I found healing from those past traumas that I had been seeking through conventional therapy for years. Also within that group, I met Karen Severson, who I now sit with every Sunday, and we lead a small women's group together here at Woodlands. Jesus has continued to show and remind me that he will never leave or forsake me, and he will always provide. The verse in the Bible that reminds me of this is Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your, present your requests to God. I'm getting baptized today to show my devotion to God. Amen. Naomi. Have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. And is it your intent, purpose, and commitment to follow Jesus in all of life, for all of life? Yes. And having heard your profession of faith, your trust in Jesus, it's with great joy that we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's stand and continue to worship the Lord. Let's worship a God who takes what's dead and brings it back to life. Amen and amen. Let's stay standing and receive, spend a moment in prayer and receive a benediction from the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we praise your name that you reached into our dark world, a world full of evidence of your goodness, the glory, the beauty of your creation, yet so marred by sin and evil. Thank you that we don't have to return to sin and death that leads to misery and darkness but we can walk out of the tomb free because you have risen from the dead, that we can depend upon you, that we can let your Holy Spirit empower us and move us to be about the things that matter most to you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for each one of these here who have made this decision to put their trust in you today. We ask, Father, that you would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that they would know, have their eyes opened and know the hope to which you have called them. We pray that you would help them to hold fast to the reality of the glorious inheritance that they have through you 
with all of the believers in Christ Jesus. And as they continue to grow, we ask that the greatness of your power, that power which raised Jesus from the dead, would be evident to them, empowering them to walk in righteousness, not perfect, but dearly beloved children of God, trusting you along the way, the one who has brought them from death to life. And we pray as Jesus prayed, that you would protect them from the evil one while they're in this world, that you would grow them up to be like you through the power of your word, your word is truth, through the presence of your Holy Spirit, enabling them to be all that you want them to be. And for all of us here, let us receive this benediction from Hebrews. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go and enjoy this day in the Lord. Thanks for being here.